The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. All right, very special guest for the BS Report today. I don't usually go with the Hollywood celebs and the Hollywood people and all that stuff, but we got to do it in this case because Friday Night Lights one of my favorite shows. It's starting on Friday on NBC at 9 o'clock, so we had to get the guy who, who basically not only did the movie, but created the show and, uh, and shepherded it and has been killing himself trying to keep it on for the last three years. Once an actor, now a director, Peter Berg. Thank you for having me, Bill. Now, you don't act. You've like basically given up on acting. Um, I, yeah, I was never, you know, I went, I, I just never quite happened for me. I never quite, I wasn't able to perform at the level I wanted to, so I, I jumped ship. You, you were headlining movies though. Yeah, but they weren't very good movies, let's be honest. I mean, my mom didn't like half the movies I made. Well, the, the Linda Fiorentino movie was a classic. The, the last production, that was probably the, that was the pinnacle. That was the pinnacle for you? I think so. I mean, I think the... The, the last seduction was was probably the the best film I did, and and you know, um, have you heard about the Alaska murder that happened two years ago? The last seduction murder. It was a copycat. A copycat, a stripper up in uh, Alaska seduced uh, you know a young guy who was who would come into the club, seduced him into killing her husband, and she was obsessed with the last seduction, and she was obsessed with Linda's character, and they showed the film. To the, to the to the jury uh, up in Alaska, they showed the entire film and they convicted her. They found her guilty. That's crazy. Yeah, Google it. You know what's interesting about your career though is Chicago Hope, which you were on, came out at the same time as ER. And if ER comes out a year later, the world was ready for a, a medical drama that year. So if Chicago Hope comes out a year before ER, you're probably still on Chicago Hope, or you I'm might have Tony left Edwards. and come back three times. Yeah. Then I'm Tony Edwards. Right, because Chicago Hope is a great show. It just was in the shadow of ER for whatever reason. Yeah, it was a little different. I mean, ER was um, ER was kind of more muscular and intense, and and uh, and I don't know, more urgent. I think. And and David Kelly wrote um, I, uh, Chicago Hope was a little quirkier. Yeah. You know, a little more offbeat, and and uh, and ER just. You know, I think maybe you're right. Maybe if we were out a year earlier, we would have, we would have had it. But ER was just so commercial, it was, you know. And, Clooney just kind of peaked right at the right time. And it yeah, it's absolutely true. Absolutely destroyed us and everybody else in their path. I have Clooney, and I think people are excited to see Goose from Top Gun with no hair. Yeah, those were the two things. <laughs> <laughs> the two things, and well, people he was alive, right? Everyone wanted to see Goose back. Come yeah, back. it was good. It was like, oh, he survived. Do you it know never my first got upset. job ever in the business was um, I was a stand-in, which means the guy that has to stand and and they light through the practice lighting while the while the stars in his trailer. Yeah, I was Edward Tony Edwards stand-in, Goose's stand-in on a movie called Miracle Mile. Oh, I remember Miracle Mile. They yeah. filmed it. They filmed most of it at that diner on That's Wilshire, right. which is in like basically five movies a year, and you think it's a real diner, but it exists solely to be only for movies. movies. Yeah, it's on Fairfax and Wilshire. It's called Johnny's. Yeah, if you dri- if you ever drive by it, you'll immediately recognize it from a hundred movies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a good movie. I like Miracle Mile. Yeah, good premise. So, you basically, you gave up acting to do. I think you directed Very Bad Things. Was your first one? Yes, I did. Um, I mean, I kind of always intended to be a filmmaker, and I I moved to L.A. Um, in the late '80s, thinking about going to film school. And instead of doing that, I just started working on, on movies, kind of became a production gypsy. I yeah. worked pretty much like, like I was a stand-in for Tony Edwards, but I worked as a grip, an electrician, a prop guy, a driver. I had all these different jobs and and sort of stumbled into acting, but always had the, the goal was always directing. So when I was on Chicago Hope, I was always hanging out with the directors. And TV is a great place to learn how to direct because you get 24 different guys coming in 
every every year to every season to direct. So I learned, you know, some of the guys really sucked, and some of them were great, and some of them were, you know, completely disrespectful, hated me, and others were very nurturing. And so I, I was able to learn a lot. Directed a couple of episodes of Friday of Chicago Hope, and then went on and made uh, very bad things, and that that started my directing career. And then a few years later. Coincidentally, your cousin Buzz Bissinger wrote Friday Night Lights. That's correct. So, he, yeah, I mean, but Buzz had Buzz wrote it. I mean, I knew Buzz, when Buzz was writing it in the '80s. I was following it, and I think I read it early in the when it right in galley form, like sometime in like around 1990. And Buzz was, you know, you know, for anyone that doesn't know Buzz, just a, a wonderfully gifted writer, sports writer, but, all, you know, a, a writer as well, journalist, legitimate journalist, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And he was always kind of one of my heroes. And I, he was, you know, fell in love with uh, high school football in Texas and wrote this great book. And it kept almost getting made. And then for different reasons, it would fall apart. But there were like five different directors attached. And as my career was kind of moving in a, in a positive direction, I kept telling him, I'm so Buzz, one day, if nobody else makes it, I'll do it. And you know, eventually, I got to a point where um, I was, you know, in the, in the, in the running for it, and 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 to be able to make that film, and to have Buzzy, who is such a hard ass, and and you know, for anyone that's ever met him, or certainly, I I, I guess he kind of got some notoriety when he went off on uh, <laughs> on the uh, HBO <laughs> show, yeah, uh, Costas, right? <laughs> I mean, but that, like that personality, that's mellow Buzz. So if for everyone, anyone that saw him and destroy that blogger, who did he go after? He went after uh, the guy from Deadspin. He he was oh, basically rabid. He was yeah, foaming well, that, at the mouth there. That wasn't rabid. Like that's kind of that's like maybe a seven for Bissinger. <laughs> okay, so and I've I've been on the receiving ends of the elevens, like spinal taps. You know, he'll go oh, to okay. eleven. Yeah, and it's so so when I made you know knowing that where he's capable of going, um, I uh, I you know I, I was nervous taking on Friday Night Lights. Mm. And I knew that if 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 he if he didn't dig it, I was going to feel it. Were you worried about Varsity Blues? I think came out four or five years before. Same kind of high school Texas football. Were you worried about maybe you couldn't do that twice, or people weren't going to well, want to I mean, see that I, I twice? Felt like I just felt like it was such a different ap- approach. You know, the Varsity Blues was. I think MTV Films produced it, and it was. Yeah. You know, it was a, it was a fine film, and it's actually a pretty popular movie. And there's like every every if you go to almost any pep rally in Texas high, high school football, the quarterback will stand up and like talk to the school, and he'll have that speech where he says, you know, last night I was lying in bed, <laughs> and, and all the girls will scream. I mean, it's still it's funny how it really is popular that film. Yeah, and I felt that you know Bissinger's book was just just much more penetrating and was a more complex story. So. I, I was pretty sure we could carve our own niche out, and also probably improve on on James Vanderbeek as the lead. Probably uh, see, I'm not <laughs> for being an ambitious go. I know uh, you I'm can't talk about that. actors. I know. Um, well, horrible. the interesting thing about me is, I mean, about uh, Friday Night Lights with me is, I love the movie. Like I, I remember, I think I even wrote this. I thought it had top thirty potential, and now well, I was nervous about you too. You were like the first. You know, you were one of my first recruits. Yeah, well, I remember getting recruited to go to a screening because we had a mutual friend and thinking, oh, man, this is going to be awkward if I don't like this. I, I have to leave and pretend I like it. And this is. And then as it turned out, I loved it. Um, and it's still really good, but somehow the TV show has kind of, I don't know, surpassed it. Like it feels weird to watch the movie because I'm more attached to the TV show. Yeah. So now I've kind of dumped the movie. Oh, come on, Bill. No, I just I, I I'm more attached to the TV show, and I I feel like I have more at stake with the TV show because I want it to stay on. I love it. Um, I think it's the best sports TV show that's been made, you know, since White Shadow, which is 30 years, and uh-huh. it, it just drives me crazy that people don't watch it. I don't get it. I I don't understand why people who like sports and like TV would not watch the show. It's tricky, you know. First of all, I so appreciate that, you know, and you and you really were actually my my editor Colby Parker Jr. just walked in and gives you a big. Love and shout out, hug. Oh, thanks. He's, Wait, he's the he, one that turned me on to you in the first place. New York, or big sports fan, and and uh, he's the one that when we were editing Friday Night Lights, you said we got to get Bill Simmons on our side. <laughs> Wait, and, let's and send him suitcases of cash. Huh? Let's send him suitcases of cash. Wait, are you? Is, I can't tell whether he's having a stroke or he's bowing to you right now. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh. Oh no, he's just oh, stop. so out of shape. It's unbelievable. Well, but when you made the transition from all right, I already made this movie. 
And now this movie's put me in a better place, and I could do some stuff now with my career. But I'm still attached to this, and I feel like this could be a TV show. How hard was it to talk one of the networks into saying, look, we're going to take this movie and basically turn it into a TV show? Because really, the history of that is is bad. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it was surprisingly easy because I was so passionate about it. And there's a guy, Kevin Riley, who was running NBC at the time. Who I, I was just one of the, the, the good guys, I think, in our business. He's now running Fox. Just a... You know, a real good guy and loves sports and is is not particularly pretentious and gets it. And and you know, I felt I was frustrated when we made the film that there were so many stories and aspects of the book that we weren't able to get to, just for 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 you know, a variety of reasons. But like you know, racism obviously was a huge theme of the book, mm-hmm. and to try and fit the concept of racism in any kind of substantive way in you know in four or five or fifteen minutes in a film, we couldn't do it. And and it was such a big part of the book and just the the whole way the educational system is organized around athletics and the way money is allocated in high high schools all over this country is, you know, was a huge part of the book. And we couldn't, so I I felt passionately that there was a lot on, there was a lot left on the table and Kevin Riley really responded well to that, you know, and, and also, you know, a, a, a lot of people know that when, when we were filming the movie, um, a young man, Named, named David Edwards was paralyzed, broke his neck while we were filming a, a real football game, and and that was something that we you know we were all present for that and we you know got to know David who just passed away. You mean you were at the you were at the game coincidentally when it happened? We were filming. We, what we did was we filmed um, we filmed high school real high school football games for the movie, and we'd intercut those games into the film so it just kind of helped with the authenticity. Wow. And we were filming a game at Austin Westlake High School, which is sort of, you know, a big fo- powerhouse football team in Austin. Uh, it was Austin Westlake against a school out of San Antonio, San Antonio Madison. And it was the fourth quarter of, uh, I think, a second round playoff game. And there was a very violent collision on the field. And a 16 year old boy named David Edwards who was playing free safety, cast, you know, got sort of inadvertently speared a receiver, a kid named Koyani, who's a, a big tight end, and David Edwards shattered his vertebrae and became an you know, instant quadriplegic. So you and, watched that whole thing unfold yes, and then and it happened, couldn't shake you know, it. Right, right in front of us, and we all got to know David Edwards quite well, and we got to actually learn a lot about, there's an organization called Gridiron Heroes that, that deals with uh, high school football players who have you know, catastrophic spinal injuries, and there's a lot more of of that happening than you would think, but but that was such a a, a profound experience for me that I wanted to do something, and that was certainly the inspiration behind Jason Street and that, the character of Jason Street. So you it's differentiated from the movie. That was one of the big things. I think Riggins had a bigger role in the TV show than the movie. Is it was that because you just wanted to expand that character, or because you had a good actor? Well, I mean, it started with, you know, we felt like we'd found the best looking guy in the world with, with, uh, this, with Taylor Kitsch. You know, that, right. at least that's what I was told by all the, the female casting directors. Yeah, he's uncomfortably good looking. I mean, it's ridiculous. You yeah. know, it's annoying. And I, I love him, but he's just too good looking. And the fact that he's actually a pretty decent actor, mm-hmm. you know, at least he, he knows not to make, he, he knows to say less rather than more, which makes him certainly you know, appear to be a, a very complicated guy and actor. Right. And and, and, he, and he is a, good, a, a very good actor. But, you know, Kitsch was, Kitsch is, you know, just clearly, you know, it, and it just, it happens. He he blew up. And, and you know, Mink is obviously a very compelling um, actress. And, and um, uh, you, know, you know, these characters just kind of well, and, off. and the coach, because you think oh, yeah, like you get that, Billy Bob. Kyle, Kyle Chandler was, you know, the, I say, and Kyle knows this. I, I, I was against casting Kyle. I didn't think it was a good idea. We, we couldn't figure out anyone to cast in that role. I wanted to cast Dwight Yoakam. That was my big idea. Really? And I, 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 I thought Dwight Yoakam was the guy. Even though Dwight told us he could only work like three weeks out of the year because he was touring, I was like, that's not a problem. Mm-hmm. We'll work, <laughs> we'll work that out, you know. But and, and people kept saying, no, it's got to be Kyle Chandler. And, and I had only known him from early edition. Remember that show? Yeah. And which I, did, I was not a fan of, and and I thought Kyle was just really young, and so I fought it. And my partner, uh, and better half Sarah Aubrey, and told me I was wrong, and and insisted that we hire Kyle, and 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 you know that was that you know I, 
couldn't be happier to admit that I was wrong because that guy is the real deal. And then you brought the mom back from the movie, Connie Britton. Yeah, and Connie was, you know, Connie got kind of a rough shake. In, in the movie, Connie had to sort of, was regulated to sitting in the, in the freezing cold stands waiting for us to shoot a cutaway of her cheering. Right. And she was furious about that. And I, the Adrian I, Balboa role. Yeah, exactly. With, with the, not even that good. Yeah. Like a, a poor, a poor man's Adrian. And, uh, uh, I think, you know, cause at least Ty, you got all the good scenes. Ty, you got, um, you know, the ice skating rink. Yeah. They gave her like two good scenes of movie where she got yeah, that. The pet then, store. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, Connie Britton didn't get the ice skating rink scene with Rocky. Right. She just was literally always in, in the stands cheering. And so I said, I, you know, I said, look, if you do the movie, I promise we'll get you out of the stands. And if you do the TV show, I promise we'll get you out of the stands. And, so you film the pilot, and then they have to decide whether it becomes a show or not, right? Right. And and then what happened was we filmed the pilot, and about a week after the pilot was done, and, and it came out quite well and got great reviews, Kevin Riley was fired, and um, which means a new regime comes in, and you then are dealing uh, with a group of people who are aggressively motivated to have your show fail. Because they don't get credit for it if it works. Exactly. And not only do they not get credit, the guy that they've replaced gets credit. So it's a so, double whammy. Right, right. So then as a result, we get put on opposite American Idol um, in the height of its power. Um, with very little promotion, um, and we get destroyed, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, predictably destroyed. And I think, you know, they, they figure they'll, they'll let us air maybe three or four and American Idol will so, you know, crush us that they'll be able to sort of gracefully get out of it. The problem is yeah, American Idol crushed us, but this odd thing happened and this rabid fan base, Per persevered and it was a fan base that was like it i don't understand the numbers but it was just enough of a fan base to screw with them it was right. just enough of a fan base that they couldn't ignore it do you know what i mean well and probably pre-internet it wouldn't have worked no pre-internet and pre-tivo because T then the tivo numbers started coming in so the rating number was pretty dismal but it was it could have been worse and it was just on the edge where you kind of go, ah, ah. you know, if you're, if you're Jeff Sucker, you go, ah, I like this show. And the number's just good enough. And then the TiVo numbers start coming in, and you realize, well, actually a lot of people are watching this show. Well, and also you were getting great reviews. Yeah, they don't care about the reviews. They don't I care mean, at all? Say, they really, they could care less. Really? They don't care about bad reviews. You know, a lot of bad, poorly reviewed shows out there that they, they don't, they, they, it's all, it's all a number game. That's depressing. It's all a number game. Well, because the reviews were glowing for the show. So the fact that they wouldn't care about that is a little – it I mean, kind I, of explains think, how TV works. You know, I think like um, – like I have a theory, and like, and I, I really like Jeff Zucker, and, and every – I just went and visited with him. And I, I always play the same – right at this time, I, I go and I visit with him in New York, and I, I – I ask him to run more spots, and I ask him for Super Bowl spots, and he tells me he'll think about it. You know, we play, we play this little game, and I ask for a pickup, and he says he'll think about it. And, and to his credit, he's given us the pickups. And I, I have a, uh, I, I have what I call the um, the um, Jeff Zucker lobby theory mm -hmm. of Friday Night Lights, which is that when Jeff Zucker, you know, he, he lives somewhere, and I'm sure in a nice apartment in Manhattan, and he has to get in the elevator and get down and, and go out the lobby and, you know, go out and get go to work. And he they, on, in that journey, he meets the, you know, men and women, his peers that live in the building that, that he lives in. And I my theory is they're not telling him those people aren't saying, God, I thank God for deal or no deal. Boy, do I love deal. Boy, I, I want more Howie Mandel. Right. I believe those people – are telling him, hey man, I love Friday Night Lights. I watch, when he drops his kids off at school, the mothers, other fathers, like, man, I watch that Friday Night Lights. And I think that that's keeping us on. So it's like almost, it's, it's guilt. Well, it's, yeah, and it's, it's yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I don't think ratings mean that much to them. But, you know, if, if I'm Jeff Zucker, or, you know, you're, you're running a network, you, you want to have something that you're proud of and that you, you know, you believe is connecting emotionally to your peers. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I think Friday Night Lights is doing that. At what point during the first season did you think we're safe? We're going to get through this season? Never. Oh God, never. Wasn't it like twenty-two episodes? 
Yeah, but you, the, the show from the moment... Well, I knew we were going to air. I knew we were going to do 22 episodes, but I never thought the show would get picked up. The only time I... Re- the, I think the high point of the show for me, when I really felt like we were under something special, was when I was filming the pilot, and uh, UT had just won the national championship, and we got Mac Brown to come on, and I got Mac Brown to... to uh, we, we, Mac had a few cocktails, hmm. and I got him to look into the camera and say, "Everybody knows you can't win a you can't win a national championship based running, you know, organizing your, your offense around a quarterback." And, oh, I remember that, and, and that was like a highlight. And I thought that if Mac Brown, what well, we could get Mac Brown to have make fun of himself on the show, at that moment, I felt like we were under something special. Well, for me, I watched the first show, and and we've we've argued about this. It bothers me after Sarazen comes in when he runs backwards 70 yards and somehow that the whole Hail Mary bothered me. Yeah. And I, and I'm really like petty and stupid with stuff like that. So I was like, you know, what? I, I'm out. I saw the movie, whatever. Right. And I, and I knew like, I knew you would launch the pilot, but I knew you weren't going to be involved on an episode, episode basis. Yeah. Cause you hand that stuff off. So I was like, whatever the, the network's not behind it. I don't want to get invested in it and have it get canceled. So, Around like the fifth or sixth episode, I started getting these emails. Are you watching? Yeah. Are you are you watching the show? Are you seeing this? Why haven't you written about this? But so now I'm stuck because uh-huh. I have no way to catch up. And you know that this was right before iTunes, so there was an, and right before this stuff was going on the internet. So basically, I just had to wait until the end of the season. And then finally, my friend Connor, who uh, who is one of those guys who knows how to get things, gets me the Chinese DVDs. Oh <laughs> he got I've some black market. So we had these Chinese DVDs that I don't even know how to like, you know, use the characters. We're guessing what the play button is and we plowed through them. And, uh, you know, by the time we got, I think for me, the, the, what was it? The slam, the slam website. What was that called for Lala Garrity? Which the, the slam site, the slam page. I that episode, that. Where, the one where Lila Garrity, where they started talking oh, they, about what a slam was. Her. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That, it was like around the eighth episode, and I was like, wow, this show has a chance to be, you know, le- legitimately great. And then I think you realized it with the, uh, the two part racist, the Smash Williams, the racist assistant coach. I just mm-hmm. thought that was one of the best two parters. So then I, now I watch all these shows, and it looks like you guys might not come back. So what happened between the first and second season? What happened? Yeah, how did you get back? You know, I think, like I said, I think our numbers were just good enough, and they were so happy with the show. And I think that Jeff Zucker is a legitimate, a legitimate fan of the show. And I think that that all added up to us um, being able to squeak by. Uh, you know, squeak getting a pickup. And if you're not a hit show, it's like a you've got to you've got to hit them from 15 different directions. Yeah. A, they've got to like the show. Your numbers have to be reasonable. I mean, I would have Minka Kelly and um, Amy Teagarden, uh, 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 you know, calling up the executives personally and trying to charm them and flirt with them. We'll do anything. <laughs> we'll be shameless. Adrian Paliki will, like, you know, we'll send her over there um, with a chocolate cake and, like, a guitar. <laughs> She'll sing to that. We'll do, like, whatever it takes to get the pickup. So the beginning of the second season, you antagonized the fans, not you personally, but the show, with the uh, the dead body storyline, which yeah, everybody kind of felt like was pushed on the show by NBC. Is that true or not? True? No, that was a decision that you know I, I was that was that was um, that was a decision that was came out of the writers' room. I didn't like that idea and fought against it, and it was we toned it down. You know, originally I thought it was like. Um, you know, the idea that these kids were going to commit a murder and, and sort of have any ability to organize themselves around, you know, evading capture, I felt like completely absurd. So I'm like, finally, we sort of said, oh, okay, well, if there's going to be a killing, these kids should act appropriately terrified and confused. Right. And, and uh, you know, we scaled it down. But I think that was probably our low point. And it, but to your credit, you wrapped it up pretty quick. You got yeah, out of we, it. Oh yeah, we we knew right away it was not working, and you yeah. know, um, you know and I mean, then, there was definitely a feeling of like, okay, what can we do? Is is there a move when the numbers are low? You start thinking, well, okay, what what's what is a smart move? You know, it's like a football game. You're losing. Yeah. Um, 
figure something out. You know, like if if something's not working, you've got to make a change. You've got to make an adjustment. Um, and uh, um, which the Giants did not do against the Eagles, <laughs> in my opinion. I wasn't going to bring that up. Uh, but you know, it was, so it's like okay, make an adjustment. It's not working, so let's see. Let's throw a murder in there, right? Let's yeah. put more sex in the show. Let's see if maybe the problem is people really aren't into the football so much, which is what we you know, really did sort of find out, which I, I think we always kind of knew that the, the actual watching of the football being played, there's a limit to how much of that the audience is, is willing to take. I was so, going to ask you about that. Is it because you definitely toned it down? Was it part that and part that it's expensive? No, it's really not that particularly expensive. We've gotten so good at doing it. It's just like you said, what can you do? How many Hail Marys can you throw? How many surprises? You know, how many times can a fumble occur or a penalty take, you know, negate a great play? It just, it becomes not particularly interesting. And then you've got these great actors. And what, when the, the marriage of Kyle Chandler and Connie Britton starts to become the most popular aspect of the show, right. why not focus on that, you know, instead of, you know, football? Yeah, it is a bit more complicated, but it's, it was really just about feeling like the show needed to move into a more dramatic character base. And the other thing, thing. I, I, as I told you before, I have not I, – I watched the first direct TV show, but then I decided I didn't want to see the shows ahead of time because I wanted to write about them. And the majority of people that read my column, they, they're going to see it on NBC. So I wanted to be progress, progressing with them at the same time mm-hmm. with, of the shows they were. But – I have heard that that you you do wrap up the Smash Williams angle this year, and you yeah. and you wrap up Jason Street, right? Yes. So I, I thought that was interesting because a lot of times with TV shows, especially good ones, they'll hang on to characters for too long. Right. And in your case, you guys kind of you're like, all right, these storylines have run its course. It's time. No, I mean, and I always said, like I said to the actors when they were all cast, I said, you guys don't. I said, you don't want to be playing high school football players when you're 28 years old, you know, and, and, and I, and I also believe like personally, you know, the, the best thing that happened to me in my career was leaving a TV show, you know, early right. I, I was, um, my character was kicked off for a Chicago hope after two and a half seasons and the show didn't go much further, but had it, you know, it's for a young actor, uh, there's no reason a young actor needs the security of a TV series for eight or nine years. I think a young actor should should be out there living life and having adventures and experiences. And and so is is and I told him that. So I said, you know, everybody can plan on maybe three years, maybe mm. four years, depending. But you know, these characters had graduated; they have to move on. Doesn't mean we can't see them occasionally in the in future episodes. But but the show. The, co- the core of the show is Kyle Chandler and, and Connie Britton, and now this this crazy Brad Leland who emerges out of nowhere. You know, is Buddy Garrity is just such a great character. But right. the, the the core of the show is this couple, and what we want to be able to do is bring bring in new young actors to you know sort of ride out a couple of seasons and then move on. That that's the goal. Well, with that said, Tim Riggins will probably be a ninth-year senior in oh, yeah, 2015. Sure. Tim, yeah. uh, Taylor Kitts will be playing football when he's 40. <laughs> you can't let him go. Yeah, he's no, coming we back again. He said we, we found won't. another year of eligibility for him. And, and we won't let him go. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a total hypocrite. That's like – because it's like, okay, well, that's the plan. But if there's a breakout actor like Taylor, okay, no, we'll keep him. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> or at least have him right. like uh... – And there will be no explanation at all. <laughs> Well, that's what I love that because it's very similar to the White Shadow. The White Shadow had Coolidge was kind of the breakout star along the lines of Riggins. Yeah. And the first season, he was a senior, and colleges were looking at him. And then he came back, yeah. and then he came back again for the third season, yeah. which many is basically a senior three times. Well, how long was Vinny Barbarino in Mister Cotter's class? Oh, forever. Forever, right? The Sweat Hogs were – and actually, they, nobody knows this, but that's why Gabe Kaplan left because he was – it's funny that you, you would have creative integrity over Welcome Back, Cotter, but he, <laughs> he was so mad that they brought the Sweat Hogs back for like the fifth year that he left the show. If you look it up, he left. But it was a, you know, the White Shadow comparison is interesting for me with Friday Night Lights because – they they basically they came to the same conclusion you did. They brought in new actors, but the problem was the new actors and the characters they played were not likable, and that right. killed the show. 
So how hard is it for you guys? I mean, you how, like how many weeks in the writer's room are you sketching out these characters trying to figure it out? Um, it's Jason Kadams who's, who's really I, – I, I'd be lying if I said I was driving this train. It's Jason Kadams right now. You know, I, I pop my head in there, and, and he runs things by me. Mm. Um, but we've talked about that. It's, it, it, look, it's really hard to, to introduce new characters. And, and um, you know, and I think that, that, uh, that you know, the sh- one of the keys to the show's ability to survive will be whether we can do that. And he's done – there's a new character introduced this year – at first, I was a little skeptical about sort of a rich quarterback whose father moves him into this town because he wants him to play in this program. Mm. And the kid, I thought at first, was not particularly interesting. And for about three episodes, the kid blows, you know, from, in my opinion, the character really sort of blows up and works really well. Mm. And I was surprised that we, and I'm like, wow, we got a new, we've got a new character on the show. Well, I'm going to give you an idea. I'm going to give you an idea for a new character just because I love the show. Pardon me? Uh, I'm going to give you an idea. Okay, what do you got? I think you got to have brothers. I, I want like the, the the brothers that move into town and the senior is really Please. good. Well, no, no, no. I want a senior who's really good, but the sophomore is better. But uh-huh. he doesn't want it quite as much as the older brother, but he's got more talent. And the coaches kind of are gravitating toward the sophomore, even, the se- even though the senior's killing himself. And he's getting the most out of his talent. I would like that angle. I think that could work. What, what position? I, I think linebacker. I think the seniors like a like a middle linebacker, and the sophomore is is maybe a safety. I like that. You know, um, the character of Jason Street the, um, is based on. Um, do you know who the Street brothers are? Do you know Houston Street is the pitcher? Uh, of course. Okay, so there were three. There's three Street brothers. There's Houston, Jason, and Jordan, and they. These are three Texas boys that all went to Austin Westlake, who are about as tough as any, you know, p- tough and polite and humble as any kid I've, uh, you know, kids I've ever met. Right. And and it's a similar dynamic. Houston was obviously more of a baseball player. They're all they're all they all play football and baseball, but incredibly competitive. Um, all very skillful brothers that, that that I did watch play. And Jason Street was inspired by the Street Brothers. Interesting. So yeah, the brother dynamic. I'm gonna pitch it. The brother dynamic is always. I, I've always been fascinated because I had this whole theory that the younger brother always ends up being the best athlete because he's he's younger than the older brothers, obviously, but he's trying to catch up to them. Mm-hmm. So he's 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 doing things at a level that are probably beyond his years because he's so desperate to catch up, and that inadvertently makes him better. And if and you look I at like Larry Bird was a younger brother. Michael Jordan was a younger brother. Like you just look at all the great athletes, and a lot of them are younger brothers. So I, I like that whole angle. I've always wondered why the brothers haven't been explored. So do you think you come back next year, or is this it? I'm just going to say yes because, you know, I have no idea. So I'm just going to say yes. I think we do. I think we come back next year. What is the What did the DirecTV experiment, for people who don't know, you sold – the episodes as a first run to DirecTV, which a lot of people don't have, and then NBC reruns them starting this Friday night at 8 o'clock? Yes. Right. Uh, At 9 o'clock, I think. 9 o'clock. So did this work, do you think, or did it have no effect? Well, we're going to find out because, I mean, one of – well, there's three options. One is that our our numbers don't change at all. We're exactly where we were last year, in which case um, that's a win. You know, we're fine. Because mm-hmm. DirecTV's thrilled. DirecTV's numbers have gone up, and they're thrilled with the whole branding that it's got done. And, and they're, you know, DirecTV's had a, a wonderful experience with the show. Yeah. So my feeling is DirecTV's happy. So that scenario is good. The second scenario is that our numbers actually go up, and people that, you know, new people have found the show from DirecTV. They come back, they watch it again, and there's just been general awareness because of the DirecTV, and all our old fans come back, so our numbers actually go up. Mm-hmm. We'll take that. The third scenario is that everybody that actually likes the show has already seen it on direct TV, and we get we do basically a zero. <laughs> That's a bad one. That's a bad one. Yeah. Okay. That's so, not good. Somewhere in there, the chips are going to fall. Well, yeah, I mean, they still haven't really found a way to measure the exact numbers with all these people that watch downloads and stuff like no, that. No, and that's great for us. Right, because I just maintain that our numbers are much bigger than they think, and you know, you know, there's no way to disprove it. 
themselves, basically. <laughs> right. We're going to have to bleep that. That's one. my answer to it. Right. I'm like, you don't know how many people. They, they tell me our ratings are, you know, are, are not great. I'm like, well, you don't know that. You have no idea. <laughs> you let, you thrive on the ambiguity. Yeah, just create as much ambiguity as you can. Yeah. You know, and like then I'll just start throwing out words like Hulu. <laughs> you know, the new website yeah. that it's where you, everybody's watching all these shows for free. And it's excellent. No, it's incredible. Yep. So meanwhile, as the show is going along, you become a, a, a director of blockbuster movies. Trying. And you did Hancock with Will Smith, which made yeah. like a gazillion dollars. Yeah, that did very well. Um, explain, explain the phenomenon of Will Smith to me. Um, the cult of personality. Pardon me? Explain the cult of personality that is well, Will Smith. I, mean, look, I think that, that part of Will's appeal is, and, and you know, um, uh, everybody. Oh, the first question everyone asks me is, you know, is Will Smith a Scientologist? And I and 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 I say I have no idea. And I generally said I actually don't believe that he is. But what I do believe that Will Smith does is he's a studier. Uh, he studies uh, philosophy. He studies religion. He studies human psychology. He's obsessed with it. And he's obsessed with his own with his own psychology, and is kind of as 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 boring and corny as this as sounds. He just refuses to to allow negativity into his life. Hmm. Um, n- not in an ignorant way, you know. He, he reads the newspapers. He understands, you know. He's involved in the world. He understands, but he he refuses to allow himself to not try and present a positive attitude towards things. You know, it's like there's an Oprah quality to him. Um, and it, it results in someone that is just undeniably likable. He seems like a very uplifting guy. Yeah. I was in the same room with him once, and everybody was just kind of like enchanted by him. Oh, yeah, it's true. You know, and I would like, you know, stare him in the eye and say, dude, I know I'm on to you. I know you're up. <laughs> you guys are working some program on me, and I'm not falling for I'm going right. to find the dark side. I'm going to find you. And, he, you know, and I never found it. Mm. If it's there, I never saw it. Well, we we talked briefly this week because we were setting up this podcast, and we and I was saying how, it, like, if there was a way to evaluate his career statistically, the way we can evaluate athletes with yeah. all these different stats, it, his career blows everybody away. It's There's, ridiculous. Well, I mean, the 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 actor who's got the biggest box office total, if 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 you just look at total box office, is Orlando Bloom. Really. But that's because he was in all the Pirates movies and he was in all the Lord of the Rings movies. Oh, well, that's... So that doesn't really count. But you, So you take Orlando Bloom out of it and you look at who's the starring in films and consistently putting up massive numbers. There's never been a sports team that's put up at this kind of consistent number, an athlete that's performed at this level, a musician who sustained it. I mean, it's it's truly remarkable how this guy... Has you know his last twelve movies have all just you know perf- and 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 these are films that are you know performing you know at at m- m- massive economic level but they're right. also pretty good movies they're not bad movies and and Will is always willing to push the envelope so things are like you know Hancock could have been a straightforward alcoholic superhero um, you know tries to find redemption. And and in that film, you know, for everyone to follow the reviews of Hancock, which weren't great, um, because there's a huge tone twist in the middle of it. And, yeah. we, and, you know, Will was really interested in pushing it into seeing if we could mix genres. Could we have, because he knew he could do that. But could he then suddenly turn a film into a real profound love story? And I have so much respect for that, you know. Film right. like Seven Pounds, he doesn't have to make Seven Pounds, of, you know, which, you know, is... is you know, experiencing similar reviews. No, nah, wait. You know, Seven Pads is getting worse reviews than Hancock did. Yeah, but the reviews aren't aren't like, oh, this movie sucks or this acting's horrible or this. It's like this doesn't really make sense, you know. Yeah. And but it's, I mean, the guy is not content just sit, simply sitting back and saying, okay, well, I can do um, fifteen different versions of my character in Men in Black. Right. Or five different versions of my character in Bad Boys. He really is trying to to shake up the genre, and it's working for him. His box office batting average is probably the highest, if there was any way to calculate that. Oh, well, by far. It's got it. He's like the Wade Boggs of, no, no, of just box go office. On, go on Box Office Mojo. His his number his his average will be printed out right there. I there's actually no, think there's no I, comparison. 
I think his career is a little bit similar to how Cruz's first like 10, 12 years was in the sense that he was trying different things, but always had his eye on, well, I still want this movie to make a lot of money. That's right. You know? And there's a balance that only a couple people have been able to find, but for some right. reason. And, and Tom, you know, they're, they're good friends. And Tom obviously, you know, kind of came off the rails a little bit at a, at a certain point and is now trying to get back on. And I actually mm-hmm. think Tom will get back on the rails. Right. Um, I, I like Tom Cruise. I um, think he's a really good actor. You know, and, I, and I, look, when, when, you, when you meet these guys and get to know them and realize that these are guys who have been – wildly famous, particularly Cruz, since he was, you know, risky business was 17 years old. Right. And I mean, it's just, it's the fact that these guys have been able to keep themselves mentally functioning, you know, in a world where, you know, you look, look at what happens to, to athletes, half these athletes when they get, you know, their first paycheck. Yeah. Or their first Super Bowl ring. You or know, look at uh, look at their peer celebrities. How many of them have gone off the deep end? Yeah, and so you know, it's up to me. It's very understandable and, and very forgivable. And and I think that like Will Will and Cruz are you know um, cut from the same cloth in many ways. And you know, I've spent time with both of them, and and they're both good guys. You know, and they're guys you would go, you know have a lot of fun sitting down and having dinner with. And you know, I tell you, Tom Cruise can talk football as well as anyone I know. The guy knows his sports very well and it's you know the, the rest of it is just noise to me i think i need to have him on a podcast oh you should play us talk college football um as well as anybody better than i can so what are you working on now working on a couple of things um uh a movie called lone survivor that's a true story written by marcus luttrell who's a navy seal um uh, about a gunfight that occurred in afghanistan in 2003 where uh, 17 uh, special forces um, soldiers were killed in a gunfight with the Taliban, and sort of a, a, a slightly more character-driven film that's in the vein of Black Hawk Down, very intense, um, very violent. You like those action movies? You like directing them? I do. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. like I like character-based action. You know, I mean, like things like I just rewatched um, Saving Private Ryan and. Uh, Fight the fist fight, you know, to the death between the two guys up in the right. up in the second story where the American gets stabbed at the end. I mean, things like that are um, you know, that kind of action is appealing to me because it's it's very emotional and and very raw and, and you know and as long as it's supported with character, I, I'm a fan of it. So, what's the movie that you're most jealous that you didn't get to direct? Saving Private Ryan. Well, um, I mean, I, Turner I, I, and Hooch. Pardon me. Turner and Hooch. I have a Mastiff, and I fell in love with Mastiffs off of Turner and Hooch. No, probably not Turner and Hooch. I like. I tell you what, the the movie that made me want to get into the movie business was Officer and Gentleman. Really, I just yeah. watched that movie, and it is surprisingly fantastic. Oh my considering God. how yeah. long ago it came out, it is. It's really one of the perfect films. But that was the movie. Um, you know, Ari Emanuel, who's, who's my best friend and agent, and you know, people know who he is now, and he and I went to college together, and we were freshmen sitting in a movie theater in St. Paul, Minnesota, when that movie came out, and we both just screamed, went out and shaved our heads the next day to look like we <laughs> here, and I think both made a commitment to ourselves and to God that we were going to get into the film business. That movie has, uh, like, a few of... The greatest scenes of the 80s, including sure. one of the... Like, what, what, what's your, what are your favorite moments from that? Well, from a comedy standpoint, I love any time... And this is Corolla. Corolla and I always talk about this. We have like our favorite movies of that have oh, a scene like this. Yeah, where yeah. where you have somebody who's either a highly decorated officer like Nick Cage in, in Con Air, or you have somebody like Richard Gere in that movie where... The locals don't like them for some reason. Yeah. And they're at the bar and they just want to have a beer and the locals are like, hey, look at you guys uh-huh. in your pansy white suits. And the ZZ top comes up. Right, right. And it, they have to put the pool cue in front of them and yeah. then they, and then they follow them outside. Yeah. And it really just enrages these people that, that, that Richard Gere is defending our country. Yeah. Like he's in training to basically fight wars for them. Um, I love that. But I thought yeah, the but fight – that moment, that moment was so cool though because it was sort of a cliched moment. But like great, yeah. Suddenly you saw a Taekwondo kick, which we'd never seen in a film. Right. The way Gear kicked that dude in the face, and then the girl's reaction was like, man, where'd you learn how to fight like that? <laughs> it was so badass. 
Well, you know what else? I, I think I saw that movie when I was 12, and yeah. Gear's best friend, who the uh, the bimbo, the buxom bimbo, yeah. kind of she she wants to put her hooks in him, so she fakes the pregnancy, yeah, and then sure. then he then he leaves the uh, he leaves training, and she's like I'm not interested in him anymore. I learned a valuable lesson not to trust women. Yeah, of course. At age 12, Good. I was like, all right, I, my How guard is now out up. In your marriage. Um, and then the fight scene with Gear and Gossett was at the end is just one of the all time greats, and Classic. you have no idea where it's going. It's Pardon great. Me? You have no idea where it's going. The oh, Gear God, Gossett scene. Great. You don't know who's going to win, how it's going to play out. It's just that excellent. Was the, that was the movie that made me made me want to get into the business, and and yeah. uh, and I just thought Richard Gere was just like the coolest thing ever. And yeah, and he's. He kind of symbolizes how weird Hollywood is, because that you know, there's no. You watch that movie and you think, "Wow, this guy is a is a mega movie star." And then I don't think he made another good movie until Pretty Woman. Like, he was like oh for his next ten in terms of projects. And then I'm Pretty Woman. To think, uh, no, they were all terrible. I'm yeah, they you. probably were. Well, he did that Heaven's Gate or whatever. That was a huge right. flop. And and uh, Breathless. Which one? He did Breathless. He did that movie that was yeah, called Breathless. like I think Money. Well, American or Gigolo was pretty good. No, that was before though. Was that before? Was American Gigolo before Officer and Gentleman? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're right. I'm gonna. I'm going on IMDb.com right now. No, I'm not gonna argue with you about. It. <laughs> no, because there's a couple of terrible before. ones. How about? Uh, did you forget about Cotton Club? How about yeah, Power? That was bad. No Mercy. That was really bad. But Kim Basinger was hot in No Mercy. Yeah, she was pretty good. Miles from Home. I don't even know what that was. And then Pretty Woman. So he had like a basically an eight year. Hey, your drought kind of Yeah, Pretty Woman, really. You can't give him much credit for that. That was all her. Yeah, but he was good in that, though. He was he was, he was serviceable. He, he was, you had to like that guy because basically he go he's a rich guy who's driving a Ferrari and picks up a hooker. So you got to like get, <laughs> you got to get sucked into him and at least like kind of talk yourself into him a little bit. Yeah. Wait, one more one more thing we got to talk about. Yeah, man. So you're at Friday Night Lights is on Directv 101, but also on uh, what is it January 14th? Is yeah, that wonder- today? Is that tonight? It's tonight. Wonderland comes out tonight. So this show you did. Got a great article in the New York Times today. You spent eight months, was it six or eight months at Bellevue Hospital? I spent six months basically living and researching Bellevue Hospital, writing the pilot to that show. Learned more about schizophrenia and manic depression and bipolar and spent time with serial killers and multiple personality disorder guys that had 11 personalities and guys that were hallucinating wild and just became obsessed with Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital, wrote this show, made a pilot, the best reviewed thing I've ever done. We shot eight episodes and they canceled it immediately after two. Similar to Friday Night Lights, the president got fired of ABC, a woman named Jamie Tarsus. They brought in a new crew. They destroyed the show, killed it immediately. It wasn't like they didn't give us a chance. Very painful. Uh. Praise, praise Jesus, and I do, that that Eric Shanks and these these crazy kids at Directv are, are they're coming out wild and they're shooting from the hip and they bought it and they're putting it on and it's gonna get you know it's on it's gonna it's gonna be seen. Well, you mailed it to me, and it is a show unlike any other. Did you get to see it? I did. Awesome. You know what was what I loved? Huh. Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs is the lead guy. That's right. That was like my first move. It's like I'm going to pick the craziest <laughs> dude I could imagine that I've ever seen in a film, and I'm going to make him the star of the show. It was so good. Although I kept I kept waiting him for to do the tuck scene, but he never did. But no, um, no, no. he wouldn't do that. You know what the issue was? I think that was a, that would have been like a fantastic FX show. Uh-huh. Or like, you know, HBO Showtime. I think for, for network, I can kind of see them just kind of freaking out. Yeah, they were like, we, there, were, there was nothing. Well, we screened it um, two nights ago at the Museum of Television and, and, and like on a big screen. And I mean, that, and it's like, that show is like, not that I would know, but from what I understand, like a big fat line of blow, whatever, whatever that feels like. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like cocaine. It's like, it gets into, uh, it, it, people were so anxious by the end of the pilot that everybody had to calm down. Sounds And I realized that I was really kind of out of my mind back then when I did that show. Obviously, you spent six months in a mental hospital. Yeah. But, but that's what happened. I mean, I spent so much time in the hospital, and I saw so much, and it's such a pressure cooker that when I finally got out and wrote the show and directed it, um, I was, I was, um, you know, it was a little bit like Pete McNeely fighting Tyson. Right. 
you know, that I just went after him with everything I had. And, and lasted about just as long. Yeah, and then they just killed us. And, but the thing is, like, we weren't really Pete McNeely because we actually had the goods. Yeah. You know, and we, and, and, and I'm so happy that, that, uh, that, you know, people now, if, if you do watch these eight episodes, you'll see the show does settle down. But the, for the pilot, we were, I was, every punch was, I was aiming right at, you know, right at the face and I was, I was swinging as hard as I could. And, well, and the show, and, and we did settle down and, and find a really great rhythm. Just ABC never gave us a chance to show that. So Friday night, so Friday night lights was like that a little bit too. I think if you watch the pilot versus like episode eight, the yes. pilot's a lot more frenetic. Yeah, I agree? mean, and that's you know that's kind of part, in part my my maturing and, and realizing you don't necessarily have to go quite that hard, quite so fast. Mm. All right, I mean, give me you're your... be really bad at trying to pick up girls because imagine that energy coming at you if you're a girl. <laughs> well, give me. Well, <laughs> I was at a wedding where you where you took as your date Parvati, Parvati the, uh, Shaw, yeah, the winner of one of the Survivor episodes. Who you know, even though there were a couple celebrities there, she was the second famous person other than Kanye West. Other than you? No, other than Kanye. Oh, okay. I was like number ten. I think I was behind like all the groomsmen. Uh-huh. Um. But poverty was pretty. I I was sad though when she voted you off at the end of the wedding. Yeah, she got me. It was so it, it's fun dating a, a survivor winner. Why? Well, it's because you just have no idea what's really going on. Because <laughs> you think she's outwitting you. You so she she is. It's like you know you go over to their house and it's like all the books are like the secrets to the Forty Eight Laws of Power, the Art of War, the Secrets of Seduction. I mean, these are the you know like. <laughs> It's complicated dating a survivor winner. That sounds like a TV show. I think She's you just pitched girl. a TV show. Yeah. By the way, Parvati's a, a super good friend and a great girl. But that's – I would want to watch a TV show or about a movie. A guy, about a guy trying to date a survivor winner? A guy who falls in love with a survivor winner and just doesn't trust her. A little bit like Black Widow with Teresa Russell, kind of, tiny bit. Well, okay. yeah, if, and if you just made it – lightened it up a little bit. But, yeah, like a know. black comedy. Like the problem with being a survivor winner is that you you know the game ends, but you're so in that mindset you can't you know, snap and, out. And, and you know I talked to Parvati about the complexities of sort of disengaging yourself from that mindset where right. everyone is a potential life threatening <laughs> enemy. You know, and just just relaxing and you know there's no there's no there's not going to be a challenge tonight. We're just going to have dinner. Right. You know All what right. I mean. There's Last no question. Tribal council this week. Um, just going to be a movie and um, a Radiohead concert. And I bought, and I made you a mixtape. And, yeah, and there's I didn't mean tape. anything by it. I just just, I just for your enjoyment. That's yeah, all. I was, that's it. Enjoy the mixtape. There's no secret, you know, yeah. subliminal message in the tape. Last question, because yeah. I know you have to go because you're busy. Um, Eli Manning, why can't he throw into the wind? I just blame Plexico for everything. That's that's a good way to handle it. Uh, my answer is blame Plexico. I blame Plexico for everything. Fair enough. I'm I mad like at Plexico. And he's probably coming back next year. I'm mad, man. I don't. I'm right now. I'm too mad to talk about it. I I blame him for everything. You know, the only thing about him is I think, you know, I think somebody like Owens is either calculating or conniving, whatever word you want to use. Plexico just doesn't seem smart to me. I don't think he does anything willfully. He's just kind of not a smart guy who got in a couple bad spots. I don't know. It's just I'm just like I went to the, um, you know, I'm a huge Giants fan, and I uh, was with I went to um, I to took my son to the um, to the Arizona Cardinals game, mm-hmm. and 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 my son is always so kind of enamored with Plexico because he's sort of scared of Plexico, but thinks Plexico is cool, and gets frustrated with Plexico, and 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 we were on this we got there early, and we're on the field, and the Giants were warming up. And Plexico came out early, and um, my son was looking at him. And Plexico looked at my son, and Plexico tossed the ball to my son and, and, and said, warm me up. Did a few patterns, did a few down and outs. And my son threw the ball to Plexico about wow. three or four times. And my son was, you know, it was such an emotional moment. And, 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 and I was so touched and appreciative. And my son at that moment, you know, owned, throughout every Giants jersey he had except for the Plexico jersey. And so... For them, for Emmett to then have to process Plexico shooting himself and, and unre- so complicated, you know, and yeah. it really was the first time that it hit home 
the, the fact that these athletes are role models and that it does affect kids and that it does, you know, it's just, it's just very frustrating. That's and a somber story. I feel like we my should. Son, what happened to Plexico and why it happened? And I, I have no answers. It's very frustrating. I, I feel like we should have acoustic guitar going. That was, I no, feel somber true, now. It's true. You know, the, and if the guy was such a great guy in one moment and, and what I said, you know, it's why shows like Wonderland should come back because these are the stories we should deal with. What is wrong with these people? What is wrong with Pac Man Jones? Like Jerry Jones puts him up at his at his ranch for the summer and pays for his mother and pays for his girlfriend and does all this, and that these guys can't get their shit together it drives me insane. <laughs> Another bleep. You know, uh, maybe maybe you should if there's a season four, which it sounds like there might be. I think you re, you have a Plaxco ripoff angle. Oh, we'll do it for sure. You got it right, but. Eli Manning should have been able to, it didn't seem to affect McNabb the way it was the win, you know, same win, same mm-hmm. football, but I just blame Plexico. All right. Good luck with, <laughs> good luck with Friday Night Lights, uh, premieres Friday night. Uh-huh. What date is that? January 16th? I should know these things. I don't know. Sometimes. Hold yeah. on. I'm looking at it. This Friday. Yeah. January 16th. Yes. Nine o'clock NBC. And you can watch on Channel 101, you can watch Wonderland, the, the Lost Pete Berg Show. Eight well, episodes. we think that uh, Bill Simmons is a genius, and we're, we're very, we feel very gr- uh, grateful to be included in your world. Thank you. All right, dude. Take care. Good luck with the show. All right, bye-bye. Okay, bye. Before I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.